This channel often investigates the dreadful living conditions of the poor in history and, with population growth and industrialization in Britain's towns and cities, that focus naturally falls on slums. The journalists and philanthropists, who provided us first-hand accounts of these notorious neighbourhoods, didn't varnish the truth of what they witnessed for the sensibilities of their audience, but perhaps didn't always go into as much detail about the extreme and harrowing squalor they saw, as much as the report you will hear today. Slums, or rookeries, are evocative of hellish urban poverty in the 19th century for us today, for good reason. Poorly constructed, overcrowded housing was characterised by gloomy, narrow streets and alleyways. They took on the no doubt unwelcome to the poor whose home it was, sobriquet of rookery. This mocking the rook, being a bird that habitually nests in large colonies crammed into noisy treetops. They are often caricatured and mysterious and dark places where journalists and cartographers feared to tread. But there were social commentators who sought to walk amongst the poor and highlight their lives and living conditions by publishing what they saw and heard. The account in this video really makes you believe that the gentleman in question didn't merely walk the streets, courts and alleyways, but ventured into the filthy and overcrowded corridors, stairs and rooms where so many cold and hungry people resorted by night in 1880s London. He doesn't always mention where he carried out his investigations, for he was writing for the church rather than the state but we know he was travelling through Spitalfields, Whitechapel and the Docklands, and there were many streets in these districts that, no doubt, could claim home to the cruel and dystopian world to which you are about to be transported. Before we move on, please consider clicking the subscribe button for more content like this. If you find this video interesting, I would really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up and share it widely with friends and family. You can also support the channel and get access to exclusive perks by becoming a channel member. Check out the Join button and description for more. Think of the condition in which the poor live. We do not say the condition of their homes, for how can those places be called homes? compared with which the lair of a wild beast would be a comfortable and healthy spot. Few have any conception of what these pestilential human rookeries are, where tens of thousands are crowded together, amidst horrors which call to mind what we have heard of the middle passage of the slave ship. To get into them, you have to penetrate courts reeking with poisonous and malodorous gases, arising from accumulations of sewage and refuse scattered in all directions and often flowing beneath your feet. Courts, many of them which the sun never penetrates, which are never visited by a breath of fresh air, and which rarely know the virtues of a drop of cleansing water. You have to ascend rotten staircases, which threaten to give way beneath every step, and which in some places, have already broken down, leaving gaps that imperil the limbs and lives of the unwary. You have to grope your way along dark and filthy passages, swarming with vermin. Then, if you are not driven back by the intolerable stench, you may gain admittance to the dens in which these thousands of beings who belong as much as you to the race for whom Christ died, heard together. Have you pitied the poor creatures who sleep under railway arches, in carts or casks, or under any shelter which they can find in the open air? You will see that they are to be envied in comparison with those whose lot it is to seek refuge here, eight feet square. That is about the average size of very many of these rooms. Walls and ceiling are black with the accretions of filth which have gathered upon them through long years of neglect. It is exuding through cracks in the boards overhead, 
It is running down the walls. It is everywhere. What goes by the name of a window is half of it stuffed with rags or covered by boards to keep out wind and rain. The rest is so begrimed and obscured that scarcely can light enter or anything be seen outside. Should you have ascended to the attic, where at least some approach to fresh air might be expected to enter from an open or broken window, you look out upon the roofs and ledges of lower tenements and discover that the sickly air which finds its way into the room has to pass over the putrefying carcasses of dead cats or birds or viler abominations still. The buildings are in such miserable repair as to suggest the thought that if the wind could only reach them, they would soon be toppling about the heads of their occupants. As to furniture, you may perchance discover a broken chair, the tottering relics of an old bedstead, or the mere fragment of a table. But more commonly, you will find rude substitutes for these things in the shape of rough boards resting upon bricks, an old hamper or box turned upside down, or more frequently still, nothing but rubbish and rags. Every room in these rotten and reeking tenements houses a family. Often, too, in one cellar, a sanitary inspector reports finding a father, mother, three children, and four pigs. In another room, a missionary found a man ill with smallpox, his wife just recovering from her eight confinement and the children running about half-naked and covered with dirt. Here are seven people living in one underground kitchen, and a little dead child lying in the same room. Elsewhere is a poor widow, her three children, and a child who had been dead thirteen days. Her husband, who was a cabman, had shortly before committed suicide. Here lives a widow and her six children, including one daughter of twenty-nine, another of twenty-one, and a son of twenty-seven. Another apartment contains father, mother, and six children, two of whom are ill with scarlet fever. In another nine brothers and sisters, from twenty-nine years of age downwards, live, eat, and sleep together. Here is a mother who turns her children into the street in the early evening because she lets her room for immoral purposes until long after midnight. When the poor little wretches creep back again, if they have not found some miserable shelter elsewhere. Where there are beds, they are simply heaps of dirty rags, shavings, or straw. But for the most part, these miserable beings huddle together upon the filthy boards. The tenant of this room is a widow, who herself occupies the only bed, and lets the floor to a married couple for two shillings sixpence per week. In many cases matters are made worse by the unhealthy occupations, followed by those who dwell in these habitations. Here you are choked as you enter by the air laden with particles of the superfluous fur pulled from the skins of rabbits, rats, dogs and other animals in their preparation for the furrier. Here the smell of paste and of drying matchboxes, mingling with other sickly odours, overpowers you or it may be the fragrance of stale fish or vegetables not sold on the previous day and kept in the room overnight. Even when it is possible to do so, the people seldom open their windows, but if they did, it is questionable whether much would be gained, 
for the external air is scarcely less heavily charged with poison than the atmosphere within. Wretched as these rooms are, they are beyond the means of many who wander about all day, picking up a living as they can, and then take refuge at night in one of the common lodging houses that abound. These are often the resorts of thieves and vagabonds of the lowest types, and some are kept by receivers of stolen goods. In the kitchen, men and women may be seen cooking their food, washing their clothes, or lolling about smoking and gambling. In the sleeping room are long rows of beds on each side, sometimes sixty or eighty in one room. In many cases both sexes are allowed to herd together without any attempt to preserve the commonest decency. But there is a lower depth still. Hundreds cannot even scrape together the twopence required to secure them the privilege of herding in those sweltering common sleeping rooms. And so they huddle together upon the stairs and landings, where it is no uncommon thing to find six or eight in the early morning. Attention will now be given to the district known as Collier's Rents, this short street leading out of Long Lane, Bermondsey, is the locality in which were recently found the bodies of nine infants, which had been deposited in a large box at the foot of some stairs in an undertaker's shop. There are around the whole some six hundred and fifty families, or three thousand two hundred and fifty people living in 123 houses. The houses are largely occupied by costermongers, bird catchers, street singers, liberated convicts, thieves and prostitutes. There are many low lodging houses in the neighbourhood of the worst type. Some of them are tenanted chiefly by thieves, and one was pointed out which is kept by a receiver of stolen goods. In some cases two of the houses are united by means of a passage which affords a ready method of escape in case of police interference. Turning out of one of these streets, you enter a narrow passage, about ten yards long and three feet wide. This leads into a court eighteen yards long and nine yards wide. Here are twelve houses of three rooms each, and containing all together thirty-six families. The sanitary condition of the place is indescribable. A large dustbin charged with all manner of filth and putrid matter stands at one end of the court, and four water closets at the other. In this confined area all the washing of these thirty-six families is done and the smell of the place is intolerable. Entering a doorway, you go up six or seven steps into a long passage, so dark that you have to grope your way by the clammy, dirt-encrusted wall, and then you find a wooden stair, some of the steps of which are broken through. Ascending as best you can, you gain admission to one of the rooms, you find that although the front and back of the house are of brick, the rooms are separated only by partitions of boards, some of which are an inch apart. There are no locks on the doors, and it would seem that they can only be fastened on the outside by padlock. In this room to which we have come, an old bed, on which are some evil-smelling rags, is, with the exception of a broken chair, the only article of furniture. Its sole occupant just now is a repulsive, half-drunken Irish woman. She is looking at some old ragged garments in hope of being able to raise something upon them at the pawn shop, and being asked if she is doing this because she is poor, she gets into a rage and cries, Call me poor! 
I got half a loaf of bread in the house and a little milk. And then from a heap of rubbish in one corner, she pulls out a putrid turkey, utterly unfit for human food, which she tells us she is going to cook for dinner. This woman has just done seven days for an assault upon a police officer. We find that she has a husband, but he spends almost all his money at the public house. Rooms such as this are let furnished at three shillings sixpence and four shillings a week or eight pence a night, and we are told that the owner is getting from fifty to sixty per cent upon his money. This is a specimen of the neighbourhood, reeking courts, crowded public houses, low lodging houses, and numerous brothels are to be found all around. Even the cellars are tenanted. Poverty, rags, and dirt everywhere. The air is laden with disease-breeding gases. The missionaries who labour here are constantly being attacked by some malady or other resulting from blood poisoning, and their tact and courage are subjected to the severest tests. In going about these alleys and courts, no stranger is safe if alone. Not long ago, a doctor on his rounds was waylaid by a number of women who would not let him pass to see his patient until he had given them money. And a Bible woman, visiting Kent Street, was robbed of most of her clothing. Even the police seldom venture into some parts of the district except in company. Yet bad as it is, there are elements of hopefulness which encourage us to believe that our work will not be in vain. Many of its denizens would gladly break away from the dismal, degrading life they are leading, if only a way were made for them to do so. As it is, they are hemmed in and chained down by their surroundings in hopeless and helpless misery. That people condemned to exist under such conditions take to drink and fall into sin is surely a matter for little surprise. We may rather say, as does one recent and reliable explorer, that they are entitled to credit for not being twenty times more depraved than they are. One of the saddest results of this overcrowding is the inevitable association of honest people with criminals. Often is the family of an honest working man compelled to take refuge in a thieves' kitchen. In the houses where they live, their rooms are frequently side by side, and continual contact with the very worst of those who have come out of our jails is a matter of necessity. There can be no question that numbers of habitual criminals would never have become such had they not by force of circumstances been packed together in these slums with those who were hardened in crime. Who can wonder that every evil flourishes in such hotbeds of vice and disease? Who can wonder that little children taken from these hovels to the hospital cry when they are well, through dread of being sent back to their former misery? Who can wonder that young girls wander off into a life of immorality, which promises release from such conditions? Who can wonder that the public house is the Elysian field of the tired toiler? We have opened but a little way the door that leads into this plague house of sin and misery and corruption, where men and women and little children starve and suffer and perish, body and soul. But even the glance we have got is a sight to make one weep. We shall not wonder if some, shuddering at the revolting spectacle, try to persuade themselves that such things cannot be in Christian England and that what they have looked upon is some dark vision, conjured by a morbid pity and a desponding faith. To such we can only say, Will you venture to come with us and see for yourselves the ghastly reality? Others looking on will believe and pity and despair.